All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this short video on five tips for flexible assignments for students. Uh, this is something that I think about a lot in, in many of uh, the courses I teach and when I work with faculty is thinking about the idea of we often traditionally just identify one thing that they can do to, you know, prove or meet an objective or, or something within the course. And uh, one of the things I keep thinking about is there's often more than one way to do that. We just tend to default to that one. And so this, it, this, start, this presentation starts to explore a couple of ways to be thinking about it. So the first thing I like to encourage is to be thinking about the bigger goal of any assignment. Uh, you know, in certain courses, you know, it's always been, you've got to write the essay just to write the essay and, you know, to, to show that you read this stuff or to show that you know this stuff. And, you know, what I would say is always try to think about what's the bigger picture or what's the bigger opportunity to get them to demonstrate their skills. Uh, within that, often if you're thinking about or thinking through the alignment of how your course outcomes and objectives align with the assignments, you know, really thinking about what is the actual objective? Because we sometimes get lost in the weeds. We sometimes think about, oh, like I, I, I really, really want them to have the formatting perfect, even though that might not be the main idea of the assignment. So really kind of take a step back thinking about what is that big objective? What is the thing that this assignment is helping the students to demonstrate they know or they can do? And holding on to that and then asking that important question, what are different ways or means of demonstrating that objective? One very basic one that I always encourage people is often, you know, that the main objective or the main goal is some kind of demonstration of argumentation with evidence. And we often default to, well, it's got to be in writing, but does it have to be? Does it have to be in writing? Can it be in video? Can it be in audio? And all of a sudden, once you start to ask that, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, you could also ask yourself, does it have to be in that five paragraph format? Can it be a letter to the editor? Can it be a fictional piece of work or a fictional interview or a real interview that helps to get at the root of that? So just start to be thinking about like, what are different ways this can happen? And that will lead us into the next question, which is jumping into what is, how are you going to assess it? How are you going to provide meaningful feedback? And I recommend developing a rubric. The first part of this is don't overprescribe. So sometimes people hear rubrics and they get really into the weeds and there's like 17 or 18 different types of criteria and like nine, you know, nine different levels of, of uh, ways of, of, of proving or, or levels of proving. Uh, I like to keep it pretty simple. You know, I have a, a version on the, the right there and I also have a link to the, the, this rubric, which is a Google doc you can play around with. But I try to keep it simple to excellent rework reconsider and absent as categories of, of uh, how well they're doing. And then in terms of the actual criteria, I keep it in the courses that I've taught, I've tended to keep it to argument, course content, style and mechanics. Now, argument is how well they do it. Course content is how much they bring in the different things we're talking about in the course. And that can be course reading videos. It can also be course discussions depending on the, the assignment that you're doing. Um, style, are they using or maximizing the form or the, the, ver the, the medium that they are actually presenting or demonstrating their, their learning in? And then mechanics, do they have the grammar of that particular form? And so if you're listening to me, you might hear me using certain types of words to emphasize this can be used, this rubric right here can be used in many different ways. This, you could use this rubric both to evaluate an essay to evaluate a piece of fiction, to evaluate a video or a podcast. So all of those things can still be used within this rubric. And always remember the rubric is just kind of marking what they're doing. You're also going to accompany that with more targeted feedback of how they can get to that excellent category. So as always, you know, thinking about that and keeping focus on the big objective, keeping language generalized so that it can be applied to different forms you can get you a rubric that you can apply to a large swath of whatever types of assignments that you're using to meet a single a singular objective. And then within that, kind of once you've got that rubric, look at it, and this will be kind of a dance. It'll be a back and forth um, where you get the rubric and then you start to think about what are the different types of assignments. Uh, and that might cause you to tweak or change some of the language, but you should still be able to largely use that rubric to address uh, each of the major assignments. Or with some variation that it isn't really 
categorically different from one another. So keeping that rubric in mind, think about the different forms. As I said already, written, audio, video, uh, I forgot to include, you know, if this is a live class, they can do presentations or performances, right? We sometimes think formally as presentation, but performance is another version or is another way of uh, demonstrating one's knowledge. Then there's different styles. You can be a first person account, whether that's memoir like or, you know, diary like, something where they're telling these things through their point of view. Uh, it can be an essay in, you know, short, medium, or large form. It can be fiction, it can be an interview. You can mix and match. So it could be a, a first person fictional story that is uh, told, you know, through audio instead of uh, written. It could be an interview with a fictional person. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can play around. They could do a play, like lots of different ways um, to play around with these different concepts. And these aren't all of them. These are just a couple I put out there for you to consider, uh, really kind of consider. There's a lot out to, uh, to play with. Once you do that, if you've got like three or three or four different types of assignments or different ways they could play with the assignment, I always encourage including a pitch your own assignment. And the reason why I like this, uh, what I think it really does is it gets students invested in how they want to do things. And it becomes a collaborative process where they're going to pitch their own assignment. Here's what I want to do to meet this assignment. And it becomes a discussion between you and the student about, OK, so what does it look like to do this successfully? So now they're not just thinking about doing it, but they're at the metacognitive level of like, how will I know that I've done this? How will I know that I've you know, presented this? Uh, and I think for, you know, whenever I've done this, one of the things I actually do is the actual developing the assignment by the student, by the student is its own major grading element within that final assignment, because they are doing extra work. They're going a little bit further than other students and really trying to own it, but also work with you to figure out how do we, how do we judge this fairly, um, given what I want to do, how I want to express my vision around this particular content. So it's a really fun one because you don't always have students taking advantage of it, but when they do, they often run with it in really fascinating ways. And then finally, make sure you allow for revisions. Uh, in general, I think this is a good rule. I think specifically when you're starting to give them some of their own choices, give them that flexibility, this is gonna be new to you, which means, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but whenever I'm teaching something new, like I'm gonna make mistakes. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna flub things up I need to give myself grace. And if I'm giving myself grace, I need to give my students grace. It's going to be new to the students. Many of their experiences, they may not have encountered this idea of like, oh, I could do assignment A, B, or C to do, you know, to meet this particular grade. Um, and then finally, you know, we want to we want our students to take calculated risks. And this is a space to do that. It's important for the learning. And so we want to recognize that if they are off target because of all of these new elements to it, there's also an opportunity, opportunity that if they really go in the wrong direction, they can come back or they can meet the need ultimately. So those are my five tips for allowing for or creating uh, flexible learning or flexible assignments for students. Here are some of those resources, including that rubric, uh, the slides and some of the images for this presentation. And if you happen to use this or are interested in using something like this and want somebody to collaborate with Spitball, uh, please, by all means, reach out to me. And if you do do it, I would love to hear from you and what were some of the lessons that you took from it. Awesome. Thank you very much.